Hello and good morning. My name is Dan Van Es and I'll be teaching the first part of this session today and Ben will be doing the second part. So today's session is on speech recognition or automatic speech recognition, which is commonly abbreviated as ASR. So we'll talk about ASR and you'll get to practice building your own speech recognition system hands-on. But first, before we jump into speech recognition, we'll talk a bit about machine learning and why it's useful for automatic speech recognition. So when we do speech recognition, we use machine learning. Now, historically, most computer programming has been rule-based, right? So you'll write some rule, like if the number of slides is higher than one, then you'll, you know, write slides, and otherwise you'll write slide. And programming languages, right, historically have expressed exact specifications of what needs to be happening. You need to tell the computer exactly what to do, how to do it, and so on, which, you know, is natural for a lot of domains, right? That's what you want to do when you write like a database, uh, you know, management system or something like that. However, for language technology purposes, it's not quite as useful. So starting in the 1950s, a lot of people were building rule-based systems, which could do some basic language technology tasks like translation and so on. But these, those rules are actually really hard to write. So about a decade or so ago, you saw deep learning emerge, which was actually much more powerful for uh, language technology purposes. And the reason that this is helpful is if we look at a machine translation example, let's say look at the English word bank. The word bank has two meanings, right? It could be a river bank or it could be a financial institution. And in Mandarin, actually, river bank is herb yen and the financial institution is an in inhang, right? So those are very different words. And somehow you'll have to write some rule if you're going with a rule-based system that disambiguates between these two, which is obviously quite hard. So even, you know, dating as far back as the 80s, people realized they could use statistical models where you would show the system a lot of translation pairs and it could figure out the rules which was the kind of birth of uh, machine learning. Now, similarly for speech processing, statistical models are a very natural fit because when you have human speech, it's obviously very hard to write rules to convert that into a transcription, whether it's a transcription in normal spelling or in phonemic notation, like the International Phonetic Alphabet and so on. There's a lot of you know, diversity, you, you could have different speakers, different amounts of background noise, different accents, and so on. And if you look at this spectrogram here, right, which is the kind of visual representation of a recording of audio, in this case, the word cat, it's really not obvious how you might write some rules that would convert that into the letter C-A-T, right, or a phonemic transcription in the phonetic alphabet. So that's why statistical models and probabilistic machine learning are critical for speech recognition. Now, let's say that we want to build a speech recognition system. The first thing we'll need is a machine learning toolkit, and then there's lots of them around these days. You can have TensorFlow, Kaldi, PyTorch, and so on. Beyond the toolkit, which kind of has all the tools you need to train the model, you also need to choose a model type and architecture. Again, there's lots of different ones. You'll hear of hidden Markov models, Gaussian mixture models, neural nets. Uh, you know, those are some of the most common model types used for speech recognition. And then beyond the toolkit and the model type, you'll also need the actual data, right? So you'll usually have some parallel data. In the case of speech recognition, you'll have audio and a transcription. Now, when you have this entire data set, it's really important that you create what's called a held out data set, where you take some of the sentences, take some of the utterances, you know, the recordings and put them apart and you don't show them to the system for training purposes. And this is so that you can later on use those utterances to evaluate the performance of your system, because otherwise you're going to be showing the test examples at training time, which is going to basically lead to memorization poss possibly, which would mean that, you know, your, your measure of accuracy wouldn't be very, uh, reliable, just the same way that you wouldn't get the questions to the test, you know, uh, before the actual test takes place. Just to take a step back real quick, you know, before we jump into speech recognition, it's, it's possible to think about this in terms of much easier examples. You can, let's say, predict the price of a hotel room, right? So you might have a data set that has the size in square meters and the price per night, which is what you want to be predicting. And you can look at the slide here and you can see the training set and you can see the test set. This is a very simple example, right? Like we can actually figure this out in our heads. Like the, you know, the, the relationship here that we have to fit is that the price equals the size times six. Uh, 
And that's true for all of the utterances in the, t in the training set, right? But if we look at the test set, we actually see that that's not always the case. There seems to be something that's not exactly linear here, which is, you know, uh, something we can only figure out by looking at the test set here. Now, this is a very simple model, right? Like you usually have a much more complicated model, but this is the kind of concept that you would use um, when you're doing machine learning. When you do this machine learning training and testing as well, you're going to need that data to be in a very consistent machine readable format. So you're going to take these pairs of data and feed them into your toolkit and tell the toolkit, look, you know, take these pairs of data, train it on, you know, these particular examples using this model architecture. So for example, you would have a spreadsheet with, you know, the input values in column one and the output values in column two, or you would have a, a WAV file with a recording and then a transcription and a corresponding text file. But it's really important that this data is clean, right? Because if you show it bad examples that just, you know, aren't actually transcriptions of the audio, it'll be really hard to fit a model. So you'll actually find that when you do machine learning, a lot of the time actually goes on data preparation or data prep as it's called, because it's super important that the data is clean and reflective of the target domain and, you know, machine readable ready for you to use and uh, that that's just going to take a lot of time and it's really critical for the accuracy of the systems so just to recap real quick what we need is a toolkit a model type and architecture and some training and test data which needs to be clean and you know machine readable this is what's actually called supervised machine learning right so we're going to show it some input and then we're going to tell the computer to fit a model such that it like kind of matches output b right and you can't really expect to flawlessly fit a model. You even saw that in the example just now, but the model is going to like make a reasonable approximation. And, uh, you know, in fact, usually if you do fit all the training data, you're probably overfitting, which is a technical term, meaning that the model has learned or internalized the problem a bit too well. Maybe it has kind of, you know, learned exactly the examples that you showed it at training time and it might not do well on the test set. All right, so let's look at a speech recognition system. So if we look at this visual here, you'll see on the left hand side, the representation of human speech, right? This is a waveform and not a spectrogram. That's another visualization that we saw just now. But basically what a speech recognition system does is it takes human speech, it takes an audio recording and it produces a textual transcription, right? Now, there are kind of two ways of doing this. In the coming slides, we'll talk about the more traditional way. There is a newer way, which kind of merges the three components that we'll talk about into one, and we'll cover that later on. But traditionally, the way that this has worked is you first take the audio and feed it into what's called an acoustic model, which is actually going to produce a phonemic transcription of this particular uh, audio recording. And you know that's gonna be in something like the International Phonetic Alphabet, which you've uh, seen before, I think. Now, once you've done that, you have a transcription of the audio in phonemic transcription, but this isn't useful for most people who don't necessarily know how to read phonemic transcription, right? So the next thing we'll do is we'll have a pronunciation model, which is gonna convert those transcriptions into words. This is actually a challenging problem in itself because there could be multiple uh, words that are written differently, but pronounced the same. So for example, if I say the word your, that could be spelled Y-O-U-R or Y-O-U apostrophe R-E or even Y-O-R-E, right? So there has to be some sort of contextual disambiguation there to figure this out. And in fact, that's what's happening with the language model, which is the third component where we have basically taken a lot, a lot of text and we kind of get the computer, the machine to uh, internalize the, the word pairings and so on that are common and not common in the training data. So it'll see like, oh, you know, if you have something like your book, then typically you'll have the possessive, right? So at that point, it'll choose to use that phonemic, uh, that orthographic transcription, sorry. Um, so yeah, so you'll have the acoustic model, the pronunciation model, and then the language model. And this usually runs in like a few hundred milliseconds. So it's a really fast process. We'll talk about these three components in a bit more detail, but we'll actually start from the language model and then go to the pronunciation model and the uh, acoustic model. So the language model, you know, once there's Unicode support and a font and uh, everything, then you can create like a text corpus in a language, right? You can 
open a Word document or Notepad and you can enter a bunch of text and you'll have a, a corpus in that language. And from this, you can actually build an n-gram language model. You can build lots of different kinds of language models, but usually what you would use is an n-gram language model. And this is a model that's trained on a text corpus to estimate how likely a given sentence is or to predict the next word and so on. And of course, there are lots of sentences that you won't ever have seen before. So it has to be able to deal with those as well, with those unseen word sequences. For example, basically every sentence I have just said to you, you've probably never heard before, but you can still somehow figure out that those are valid sentences and so on. So there has to be something built into this model as well. So these n-grams are basically sliding windows. So you'll have unigrams and bigrams. Unigrams are just one word. Bigrams are two words. And then trigrams are three words and so on. Nobody thinks that this is how the human mind works, right? Like nobody who works on speech recognition thinks that that's how it works, but this is actually remarkably effective. And if you want, you can play with this collab that actually get, uh, lets you get a sense for how this works. So these language models are not just used in speech recognition, right? They are also used in smart keyboards. If you ever use a keyboard on your smartphone, you'll see it do things like auto correction, next word prediction, completions, maybe even gesture typing or glide typing. Those are all things that a language model deals with on your device, you know, and that's usually going to be an n-gram language model, although it could be a neural language model. It's not that common these days. When you train these models, right, you have to be very careful about the kinds of training that you use because they will really, you know, learn how language works based on that. At least they, they will learn some approximation to how language works. So if you have something like I'm going to my grandma's, you probably want to be careful not to predict funeral there, right? Like that might be something that is very common in a particular bit of text. Um, but this sort of uh, behavior can be picked up by the model and then like introduced in other places where it's not contextually appropriate. So again, it goes back to you have to think about the full width and breadth and diversity of the ways in which your applications are going to be used. Now, when you're going to create these language models on top of these kind of appropriateness questions that I just mentioned, you'll also have some other challenges, right? So first of all, you'll need to get some training data in this particular language. Another thing that's really important is you need to have some scalable infrastructure, right? You cannot sit there and do this one language at a time where you have to do it 7,000 times over if you want to cover all the world's languages. So you want to make some sort of infrastructure where you can take in a text corpus and quickly train a language model and, you know, do the sort of evaluation that you want to do. And fortunately, there's a lot of great infrastructure around these days, but that is something that's really important. When you get the training corpus, it's also important to look at its consistency, right? Like we just mentioned, you need the data to be machine readable and consistent. So one thing that you might never have thought about, but that's actually quite a common problem in the, the world's languages, is that not all languages have a standardized orthography, right? So they don't always have a standard set of spelling rules. And, you know, maybe there are two sets, maybe there are multiple, maybe there, there are just no standard spelling rules. It's actually really rather common. And even in English, you'll see this on things like uh, social media, right, where you might see totally non-standard orthography in use. So then you have to wonder, like, is this the sort of appropriate corpus to train my next word prediction model on? Some languages like Limburgish, which is spoken in the Netherlands, like they just see a lot of different ways to spell the same word. There's an example on the slides here. And, uh, you know, how do you deal with that when you deal with um, such diversity? How do you make sure that your model still works properly? A somewhat more straightforward problem, perhaps, you know, beyond this diversity is just that word lists and corpora are usually relatively small. So English has billions of sentences available. That's not going to be the case for most languages. Having said that, that's not always a critical problem. You know, you don't necessarily need a bigger data set. You just need clean and domain matched data. So by domain, we mean it has to be on the same topic and, you know, kind of the same, you know, level of formality, the same way of speaking. All right, so now let's talk about pronunciation models. So we have this language model, right, which is in orthography, in the standard spelling of the language. But human speech doesn't use spelling rules necessarily, right? Human speech has phonemes and sounds and so on. So what we'll need to do is we'll need to connect this language model to human speech. The way we do this is we basically map the orthography to the pronunciation in phonemic transcription. So we do this by using a pronunciation model, which is usually uh, called like a G2P model for grapheme to phoneme model. 
you might also hear letter to phoneme or letter to sound, but you know, it's all the same concept. The idea here is very simple. You need to take a word and output its pronunciation in the International Phonetic Alphabet or some other phonemic transcription system. Now, this is actually a very interesting problem because there are lots of different writing systems in the world and different letters and different groups of letters, like maybe you'll have two letters coming together, have different pronunciations in the different languages of the world, right? So you can actually see that depending on the specific GDP rules of the language, you have a lot of you know, differences in accuracy for these GDP models. Um, it's always a lossy process. You know, you, you're going to have some words that are just basically not pronounced the way you would expect them to pre be pronounced based on the spelling. Um, but how lossy it is depends on the language. English actually is notoriously bad. As a non-native speaker of English, I still remember you know, when I first learned that the uh, letter W in the word sword is not pronounced, it's not pronounced sword, but why is it not pronounced sword? It makes no sense to me. It actually doesn't make a lot of sense in general. There's not really a rule that explains why, right? But it's clearly swore, swam, swim, but in the particular word sword and in swordfish and so on, that, that W is suddenly like silent, right? And this is a super interesting problem uh, where there has to be some amount of human linguistic knowledge injected and some sort of generalization again by a machine learning model. So usually you actually use a machine learning model that's been trained on a uh, dictionary that has human pro provided pronunciations. It's especially critical for loan words, right? Because they just tend to have all sorts of interesting pronunciations where you might have an unexpected relationship between how a word is spelled and how it's pronounced. Now, you know, in addition to these kind of statistical machine learning methods for GDP, where you use a dictionary and then train kind of a small GDP model on that, you can also have rule-based GDP um, where you basically provide rules to map graphemes into phonemes. And you can maybe have context dependent rules like, oh, you know, if this particular letter appears in word final position, it's pronounced like this, but in other contexts it's pronounced like that and so on. So there are some domain specific languages like Thrax, OpenGRM, um, but you can also just use a TSV file. And uh, in fact, I think you would mostly see kind of hybrid systems where there's kind of a manual lexicon first and then uh, either a rule-based or a statistical system. So looking at an example of this, on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, grapheme to phoneme uh, mappings for this particular language here. And what you see is a TSV file where the left-hand side has the uh, the letters and then the right-hand side has the phoneme. So you can see, for example, for the NG, right, you've got like the little uh, IPA symbol there for an ung sound. Um, and for some others, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, like for example, the, the letter M in the spelling is also just an M in the pronunciation and that happens to be the same symbol. All right, so let's say that we have a pronunciation dictionary, right, which we've generated by using these GDP mappings, or maybe we've just had somebody write the pronunciations manually. Great, right, we're done. We have the language model, we have the pronunciation model. Let's talk about the acoustic model. Well, actually, before we go there, we have to think about one other complication, which is called written domain transcriptions. And this is something that seems super natural, super obvious to most people who don't work in language technology, but it's actually a really challenging problem. So if you take a price, for example, right, you'll see like a, a euro symbol or a dollar symbol and then the digit five, that's actually pronounced five euros or five dollars. Lots of strange things are happening there. All of a sudden we have this currency symbol that's switched places, right? Like we're saying like five dollars instead of dollar five or uh, anything like that. Um, we also have times, right? Like 1.30, half past one, like what happened to the half past one? Where did we get that, right? So when somebody says, you know, set an alarm for half past one, we actually do need that to be written down in a particular, you know, written domain form where we write one, three, colon, three, zero, or something like that. Um, and this is a very different problem than GDP, right? Like you, you might even see some, you know, context dependent, uh, verbalizations as they are called. So for example, like WA could be Washington state in the United States or Western Australia, right? Uh, 
Um, and a lot of the time you'll again see these tracks grammars uh, be used for verbalization. So there's a lot of machine learning research happening in this space, but it's actually quite hard. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of verbalizations that you might need. And there's this uh, overview that I uh, worked on together with a colleague, which kind of lists them all. You'll be surprised at how many there are really. Now, given the sheer diversity of verbalization problems, right, whether it's times or currencies or, you know, URLs, email addresses and so on, it's actually typically easiest to just use spoken domain initially. So you just write down like the letters O and E instead of like the digit one and so on, because otherwise you have to create these verbalization grammars. Now, having said that, you know, if you do want to make a state of the art, you know, commercial grade speech recognition system that can also be used for voice assistance and so on, you probably do need to have those verbalizers just so that you can handle things like times and so on. And in fact, a lot of work has gone into making it faster to develop these verbalizers. So um, my colleagues Kyle Gorman and Richard Sprout, for example, have worked on ways where you can elicit 300 targeted numbers and then basically you can infer all the different other transformations that you need for numbers. The way that you do this is you kind of strategically pick the numbers that you elicit, right? So you get all the numbers from 1 through 20 and then you get 21. But you don't need to get 22, for example, because that's usually going to be pretty consistent. You just put the number for 2 in the place of you know one in the word 21 then you get the number 30 and the number 40 and so on and you know this way you can kind of get some sort of minimally supervised number normalization which you can induce uh, the full system from and we've actually published a database of these number names in 186 languages if you want to take a look so then you know coming back to the kind of right hand side of our entire graph where we had the like language model and the pronunciation model what we'll have, right, is we have a pronunciation model which deals with these pronunciations, the graph and two phoneme rules, as well as verbalizations optionally. And this is going to be a critical part of how we deal with the language model, how we connect it to human speech, right? So we're going to take all the different words in the text corpus, you know, maybe we, we have some books or dictionaries or like a web crawl from the target language. Maybe we have some, you know, words, some sentences from the actual existing transcriptions, if there has been previous transcription work done in the language. Um, maybe later on, we'll come up with some additional words. You know, this part is not dependent on the audio yet, right? So we'll have all these different sources of text and we'll create a list of words and we'll feed them through the GDP model. We'll feed them through the verbalizers. And at the end of the day, we end up with this system vocabulary, which has a list of words and their pronunciations. Now it's important to understand some of the limitations here, right? The way that these classical traditional systems work is they have this fixed vocabulary um, where if you haven't seen the word in the language model training data at training time, or you know if you haven't added it at inference time, you cannot actually recognize it. So they're not able to recognize new words. When a new word suddenly comes up, you have to add it to the vocabulary. That's fine for most purposes, although of course in some circumstances like languages where lots of new words are formed all the time, that's actually going to be more challenging. So this is a limitation that you have to be aware of. Now, another problem, completely different problem is that this assumes that you can somehow figure out what the words are by just looking at the text corpus. For a lot of languages, you know, you can basically just look at what white spaces appear in the text and then say, okay, look, we're gonna use these white spaces as word boundaries. But in fact, this doesn't work in all the languages, right? Languages like Chinese or Japanese don't use white spaces in that way. And so you'll need some sort of like word segmentation model that figures out where the word boundaries even are. So this is the way uh, that this works in these traditional systems in, in more modern end-to-end uh, -end systems, which we'll talk about later. This doesn't really occur as a problem, although they still have the issue that, you know, they cannot really like learn anything that hasn't already been observed to some extent at training time, they can generalize, but they still need to have seen enough examples at training time. So, you know, to kind of wrap up the section on language models and pronunciation models, right? You'll basically train these language models on as much text as you can find in the target language, ideally in the target domain. You don't need audio for the bits where you have the language model so you can use text that don't in that doesn't uh, have any corresponding audio and the reason that this works is because we can use these gdp models and these verbalizers to create a phonemic transcription all right so with language models and pronunciation models and verbalizations out of the way let's talk about these acoustic models right so 
like I mentioned, we're going to take some audio recordings and their transcriptions, and then we're going to ask a machine learning toolkit to train a particular kind of model for this, whether it's an HMM or neural net. We're going to take these examples of audio and transcriptions and feed them into this toolkit and ask the toolkit to create this model, right? Now, the transcriptions, that's actually going to be interesting, right? You are going to be able to get these transcriptions in multiple ways, right? You could ask a linguist to write a phonemic transcription for every single audio recording, but that's actually relatively hard. It's relatively challenging for human annotators to write these uh, phonemic transcriptions. So normally what you would do is you would actually get the audio recordings and get them transcribed orthographically in the standard spelling system of the language. And now you might say, well, how are we going to train the acoustic model, right? Because we're going to train this acoustic model to emit phonemes, right? We're going to get it to take in audio and emit phonemes. But how are we going to do that if all the training data we have is actually just audio with standard spelling transcriptions, not phonemic transcriptions? Well, the answer to this question, uh, you know, is actually rather obvious. What you'll use is you'll use this GDP model to take your uh, transcription in standard spelling and turn it into a phonemic transcription, such that you end up with audio recordings with phonemic transcriptions, you know, which have been generated by the GDP. And this is actually really great because now we can take our audio recordings and the uh, standard spelling orthograph orthographic transcriptions and we can um, you know use those to train a model that actually emits a phonemic transcription for an unseen audio recording which is great because as we discussed earlier writing rules to go from spectrograms to phonemes would be really really hard so we're going to use uh, this machine learning approach instead and it's going to be much easier to look at an example, right, like you you can look here at this uh, example from the Favorline workshop, you'll see uh, at the bottom the um, normal orthographic transcription. And then above that, you'll see the phonemic transcription, which has been aligned to the exact place in the audio where they appear. There's a trick that you can use to get these alignments uh, using uh, forced alignment, which you can click through to the Favorline workshop if you're interested to learn more about that. But at the end of the day, you end up knowing exactly which part of the spectrogram, which part of the waveform corresponds to that particular uh, phoneme. And uh, from there on, you can train these um, acoustic models. Now, usually the acoustic model is actually not trained to take the raw waveform or the spectrogram as input. Uh, what you actually normally do is MFCC, which is uh, shown here on the right hand side, which basically is just a way to capture the dynamics of the speech in a slightly more interpretable manner, at least for a machine learning model. So it is a simplification of the speech, right? If you look at the spectrogram there versus the MFCC representation, of course, the spectrogram seems to have a lot more you know, rich detail, which is true, but it also includes a lot of detail that you don't need to actually be able to recognize the speech, right? There might be speaker dependent differences, which the MFCC feature kind of uh, tries to abstract away a little bit. So it's actually usually these MFCCs that are used for acoustic models. So we'll take these audio recordings, convert them to MFCCs, and then we'll uh, pair them up with these phonemic transcriptions, which we've derived from the written domain transcriptions, uh, you know, the, the standard orthographic transcriptions. Uh, using GDP. So we take these MFCCs and the uh, phonemic transcriptions and then feed them into some machine learning toolkit and go from there. Now it's worth pointing out one thing on this particular slide, which is that if you look at the spectrogram, we've actually marked two places. So we've marked about the 8 kilohertz boundary and the 16 kilohertz boundary. Most phone connections, for example, historically haven't supported more than 8 kilohertz. And you know, most speech recognition systems in general don't support more than 16 kilohertz. So they cut off everything above the 16 kilohertz line, which, you know, there is signal there, but it's actually like relatively rare. If you look at it here, you can see there's basically no human speech signal visible anymore in that spectrogram. Um, the eight kilohertz line on the other hand is kind of interesting because you do see that there is signal being lost if you cut there. And that's actually why historically phone connections have sounded a little weird. Modern phone connections also go up to 16 kilohertz and you can have the full richness of human uh, voices represented there, but older phone lines wouldn't necessarily have supported, you know, that sort of a frequency uh, connection. So that's just something that connects it back to, um, you know, non-machine learning applications. All of this is also related to digital signals processing and in many, you know, ways that go back decades. And if you want to play with these uh, waveforms and spectrograms and MFCCs yourself, there's an excellent collab that you can upload a recording to and you can see what it ends up looking like.
All right, so let's say that we have gotten our hand on a text corpus as well as some audio recordings with a set of orthographic transcriptions and we've created some GDP rules or we've gotten a pronunciation model. Now we're pretty much ready to put everything together, right? Maybe we also have some verbalizer rules. So we're gonna put all of this together. We have these language models derived from the text. We have the pronunciation model, which includes the GDP, maybe the verbalizers. And we have an acoustic model, which we've been able to train using these audio recordings, which had been transcribed. You know, we're gonna put all of this together. We're gonna to build a speech recognition system. And now we're gonna take this test set that I mentioned earlier, right? Remember how we took some utterances, we took some recordings and we held them out. We put them to the side. We wouldn't use them at training time. Well, now is the time that we're gonna use them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect all these models, the acoustic model, the pronunciation model and the language model. And then we're going to take our test set and put it through this entire system. So what we'll do is we'll feed them through and see how our system does. And the way that we actually see how it does is we compute a standard measure of accuracy, which is called the word error rate. Lower word error rates are better. So 5%, for example, means that you get 5% of all the words wrong. 10% you, you would get 10% of all the words wrong. So the way that you do this is you basically calculate the number of substitutions versus the correct transcript, the number of deletions and the number of insertions. Remember that this is a test set for which we know the correct transcript, right? Because we, we had it in that set of recordings with transcriptions and we took this uh, you know example and put it to the side. So, you know, we know the correct answer. So we're gonna basically compute how many substitutions, how many deletions and how many insertions there were. And from there, you can calculate the word error rate by you know, dividing this number through the actual number of words in the reference transcription. The, the reference transcription is the correct transcription, right? And this gives you the word error rate. Usually you would see about like maybe five to 10% for like commercial grade English speech recognition systems. Uh, human transcribers are actually also not perfect, right? They, they will make some mistakes sometimes. And uh, that's what you'll see, but you know, five to 10% is not something that you're going to achieve easily with a small training data set. On the other hand, even numbers as high as like 30% or 40% are still going to be possibly quite a good place to start from when you're a field work linguist and you have, you know, maybe dozens of hours of recordings that you would like to work on. It'll probably save you some time. That's something that you, you know, would have to talk to the field work linguists about, of course, to see exactly how that works for them. And that's um, an important area where you need to have this sort of cross discipline collaboration. But that's an entirely separate topic. We can talk about that some other time. For now, I'll say that that was basically everything that we wanted to cover about speech recognition systems. All right, so we talked about how you train a speech recognition system and how you generally build machine learning systems, right? And we mentioned we would use some sort of toolkit together with some training data and some model architecture, and we would build these machine learning systems, these speech recognition systems. So let's actually look at some ASR toolkits. The one that you will see most commonly is called Caldi, which was originally built about a decade ago it's a very high performing toolkit in terms of both uh, compute throughput as well as accuracy. And it's always being updated to include new model types and architectures, a lot of labs and you know companies use it. It's well supported. There's a lot of documentation on Caldi. And this is actually what we'll look into a little bit more for the rest of today's session. So Caldi, you know, dates back about a decade. It's, you know, it's a little hard to use sometimes, and you'll see that too, but you know, fortunately there has been a lot of work put into uh, improving things. And uh, you know, it is one of the world's leading toolkits for speech recognition. So that's what we'll be using. All right, so when we do this training, right, like we said, we, we're gonna do the data preparation first, and we're gonna build these files that we need with all the example audio recordings and transcriptions and so on. Like we said, we're gonna use MFCCs instead of waveforms or spectrograms. So we're gonna run what's called audio feature extraction to create these MFCCs. We're gonna prepare all the language model data and actually train this language model. So we're gonna count all the different n-grams and apply this sort of um, 
handling for unseen word sequences, which we talked about in case there are sentences that we haven't observed before. There has to be something which is called back off, usually through some sort of smoothing. Um, and then we're actually going to train this system, right? So usually what you'll see Kaldi do is initially it'll train what's called a monophone system, which is a system that recognizes one phoneme at a time. But then later on, it'll switch to triphone training. And the reason that this happens is that when you have a sequence of phonemes, there there are co-articulation effects, basically meaning that you're going to have different pronunciations depending on what the preceding or following phonemes are. So you might have a totally different pronunciation of the letter, you know, or the sound k in uh, the word cat versus school. You know, those, those are going to have different pronunciations. They are slightly different, but they are different. So that's why we usually don't just use monophones, but we use triphones. Now, at the end of all of this training, right, so we'll have trained this language model, we'll have trained the acoustic model, you know, after we got the MSCC features and we built the monophone model, we built the triphone model. At the end of all of this, what we end up with is what's called a decoding graph. And that's what we're going to actually use to take unseen audio and we're going to pass it through the decoding graph to actually get the right answer. The reason it's called a decoding graph, right, is the concept is basically that audio is something that has to be decoded. So it contains some sort of signal that just, you know, needs to be discovered. We need to decode the signal and figure out what the actual answer to this particular recording is, the, the correct transcription in this particular case. Now, most systems use uh, finite state transducers to build these decoding graphs, and so does Kaldi. These finite state transducers or FSTs, they are used to kind of figure out the optimal sequence of things. And the way that they do this is based on weights. So these weights are actually coming from the language model with these n-gram probabilities, these n-gram counts and so on. And we've included the visualization here of a basic um, part of the decoding graph. So this is the way that you visualize these FSTs you'll see at the leftmost you know, uh, state, which is the one marked zero, that's the initial state. It has a single bold circle and that's where you start. And an FST works by having kind of transitions. So there's like an arrow going from zero to one, right? That's a transition. And then there's like, you know, two arrows, one leading into two and one leading into three. Those are again, transitions. So you have these transitions there and the transitions happen between the different states of this particular graph. So zero is a state, one is a state, two is a state. And you might also see those things be called like arcs, right? So like, you know, the arrows between these different states are arcs. And as you can see, there are different answers. That's because just like in the example that we had with the word your, you know, there could be different ways that you might spell this particular uh, word depending on the context. So there are different options, which, you know, those different contexts are represented in this particular decoding graph by having different arcs um, leading into different states and so on. And these states would mean that you would have a different partial transcription at that point. Now these transitions can have weights, right? Um, based on the language model, the probability, but also based on the acoustic model probability. So the acoustic model actually doesn't just output something saying, oh, this here is definitely a P or this here is definitely a B. It actually outputs a probability distribution for every frame. So every bit of audio saying, oh, you know, it's 80% sure that it's a P, 15% sure it could be a B and 5%, you know, there might be some other sounds that it thinks could be appearing in the audio there. So you kind of get all these weights from both the acoustic model as well as the language model, and you combine them in this decoding graph. You know, we're just showing a little small part of the decoding graph here. And, you know, you're going to feed through this unseen audio and get an answer. On the right hand side, you also see a final state, right? So that has a double circle, meaning that that's kind of, you know, the end of it all. And this decoding graph at the end of the day consists of a bunch of different FSTs. We're just showing a small part here. Um, but there's the H and the C, which are responsible for taking the acoustic model and basically um, producing a lattice of phonemes. So lattices are basically just um, these sorts of graphs, FSTs, where we have a different set of options. So we might have a per, we might have a bur, we're not quite sure. So we represent that uncertainty in a lattice. We have the H and C, which are responsible for turning that, for creating that uh, acoustic, acoustic model output lattice, which then gets turned into uh, pronunciations by the lexicon, which is the pronunciation model.
And then finally, we have the G, which is the language model. So confusingly, the LFST is actually the lexicon, which is the pronunciation model, right? And the GFST is uh, the language model. So the LFST is not the language model. The GFST is the language model in our earlier graph. So at the end of the day, once we've done all this training, we've created a decoding graph, and uh, now we can feed in some new audio. And so just to show you one more example of these lattices, which are used to express ambiguity, you know, here's another uh, lattice, which has a lot of alternative word sequences. And at the end of the day, the one that we'll use in this particular decoding graph is the one with the lowest weights, right? So the one that both the language model and the acoustic model combined think is uh, the most likely. So lower weights mean uh, that it's more likely. And that's basically how systems like Caldi and many other speech recognition systems work. We have these acoustic models, these uh, pronunciation models, these language models, which we convert into FSTs. Eventually, the acoustic model itself is not converted into an FST, right? But the output is basically FST-ified, um, turned into an FST. And, you know, we take all of this, we put it together in a decoding graph, which has weights, and then we use those uh, decoding graphs to resolve the ambiguity, which is expressed by the lattices. So, you know, let's say that you have something like Caldi where you can do all of these things, you know how to train them, you know how to use the recipes and so on. You would say, great, you know, the world has 7,000 languages, let's get right to it, let's build these systems for all the different languages, right? It's actually not that simple, right? Like Caldi is very powerful, but it's also quite difficult to install and to use. And it's, you know, particular about like the way that the data is formatted. It needs to be a very specific format. So there's a lot of challenges there, right, between saying, okay, good, we have a machine learning toolkit and great, let's train these models for lots and lots of languages and help, you know, field workers, help communities, help people around the world. Even, you know, in the face of those challenges, though, there is still a lot you can do. And in fact, at the center here in Brisbane, as well as in Melbourne and uh, Sydney and uh, in Canberra, a lot of work has been done to actually use Caldi to accelerate transcription for the world's languages. And I'll hand it over to Ben now, who will talk about that. Thanks so much and have fun.